Thank you very much, Dominic, and it's a great pleasure to be doing a webinar and to feel that there are all these people all over the world listening in, and good evening to those of you in the UK, and probably good afternoon or morning to some of the rest of you. Um, I'm pleased to be talking about understanding dyslexia by studying the brain, and uh, I think I was invited to talk on this topic after Dominic saw a blog I'd written relevant to, the, uh, to this issue. Um, right at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll give you a link to my blog, which has a number of things that may be of interest to people interested in this area. But to begin at the beginning, I thought it was, I was quite interested to force me to think back to what it was like when I learned to read, which was a great many years ago, and I'm afraid my, oh, here we go, <laughs> I was going to say my controls have stopped working, but um, I learned in the 1950s, would you believe, and I remember these books called Janet and John, which we were given, um, where small children were supposed to learn to read by having these very repetitive little sequences uh, with these two rather boring children, Janet and John, who had limited conversational skills and vocabulary. But um, what was interesting to me was I was uh, five when I was first introduced to reading, which was at that time the normal uh, age at which British children learned to, uh, first went to school. And for me, it was really trivially easy. Um, I remember thinking at the time, why hadn't I been allowed to read earlier than this? Uh, because I just loved it and found it really problem free. And I found it very hard to understand why there were other children in the class who had difficulties. And then I found, though, that sometimes the boot was on the other foot. So many years later, when I was studying psychology, um, we learned about all sorts of cognitive abilities, and I was confronted with problems like this. Now, I'd be quite interested just to get the feel of the audience as to whether you can solve this puzzle. And uh, the idea is which of these four shapes, if you folded them up and uh, instead of flat things, you turned them into cubes, would be equivalent to this cube at the top. So I'll hand over to Dominic, who will allow you to place your answer. Okay, so here, unfortunately, we could not show the images on the poll, but uh, perhaps you can remember and choose between A, B, C, and D. Uh, so oh, we see, we see, it harder. We see, so this will make it harder as a task. Uh, we, uh, but we see, we see the responses are coming in. About 47% of people have uh, sent in a response and rising, and it's 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 a bit neck and neck uh, with one of the letters uh, being ahead, and I will share the results in a minute, just as soon as uh, most people have uh, made their choice. So is it a, uh, a few people just did not uh, have a chance to perhaps look closely enough. Yeah. So I'm just going to close the voting now and share the results, which are A, got 44%, B, 17%, C, 22%, and D, 17%. So the A seems to be uh, the most popular yes. option. Well, I I suspect that A is correct, but as I explained to you, I, I really find this uh, hopelessly impossible. Uh, my brain feels as if it's melting when I'm confronted with problems like this. And this realization that different people have different types of skills really, um, I think, is quite important and made me fascinated to study the reasons for differences, which, of course, have to, at some point, be in the brain. It's the brain that does these sorts of puzzles. It's the brain that learns to read. And um, so my whole research career, really, has been focused on trying to understand more about why some people find some things much easier than others. And I'm very conscious of the fact that because I've grown up in a society where reading is really important and valued, it's, I've had the huge advantage. Whereas if I'd grown up in a society where there was no literacy and you had to forage and be a hunter-gatherer, uh, when visual spatial skills might be rather more important, I would have been at a decided disadvantage. So there's a sort of sense of slight arbitrariness about one's benefits and uh, how lucky you are to have gone into the world with the right sort of skills. Um, but what's going on in the brain in dyslexia? Um, when I started out researching in this area, um, the popular idea was to think about there being possibly some kind of uh, brain damage occurring around the time of birth in children who had all sorts of specific learning difficulties. And there was a notion that was called the continuum of reproductive casualty, which was really referring to the fact that um, around the time of birth, uh, the brain is very vulnerable, 
both uh, to damage and to lack of oxygen, leading to many um, maternity wards and places having signs up saying the first day of life is the most dangerous, we really have to preserve babies. And I remember going into one hospital where somebody had written underneath, the last is not without its perils, which I thought was rather nice. But the idea here is really that um, we know that uh, severe uh, lack of oxygen, for example, when you're born uh, w will lead to death. Um, and that uh, uh, um, less severe but still severe anoxia may cause severe handicap, um, cerebral palsy and all sorts of other adverse consequences. But the idea was to think, well, maybe there's a continuum and that there are other children who have much milder problems which we just don't notice so much at the time that they're born but which lead to specific learning difficulties. And this was a very popular view. However, the evidence really just didn't support it. And one source of evidence, of course, just comes from looking at children with conditions such as dyslexia and tracing back their medical histories. And that really didn't find much evidence that they had particularly unusually difficult births in general or were very premature. Um, but the other sort of evidence also came when we developed brain scanning. And this really only came into its own, um, I guess, in about the 1980s, 1990s, we started being able to form these very nice pictures of the brain in immense detail, showing you all the gyri, which are the sort of bumps, whoops, and the uh, sulci, which are the bits in between, the, the sort of fissures in the brain. And I think when people first started being able to do this, the impression that they had was that we would take a child with severe reading disability, for example, and see evidence for lesions, for, for areas of dead tissue, um, and perhaps for malformations in the brain that were very severe. And people were really, I think, surprised at just how normal the brain looked. These are just a couple of figures from a single case study done by Chiarello and colleagues uh, of a man who had a very severe dyslexia. Um, and the red lines I'll talk about later on, are to, they were arguing, in fact, that there are some oddities about this brain and that the um, particular locations and patterns of some of these wrinkles in the brain were rather unusual. But the basic finding is still that most uh, experts just looking at a brain like this would not really pick up anything odd about it. So we really do not see these signs of brain damage or malformation on an MRI scan. The other bit of evidence that turned people against the idea of acquired damage was uh, evidence from genetics. And this comes from various sources. But one of the early uh, types of method that's been used over many, many years to try and study whether something's got a genetic basis is to look at twins. Um, in fact, people, when I say I do twin studies, people often think I must be trying to find twins who are um, separated at birth because that's the sort of exotic condition that we've all heard about. But in fact, most twin studies are not particularly looking at unusual situations like that. What we're doing is looking at twins who are growing up together, and so you expect them to resemble each other because they're exposed to an awful lot of similar experiences. They may indeed go to the same school, and obviously they have the same home environment. But the interesting thing about twins is that we can compare two sorts of twins. So we have nature's experiment here. So we have what we call MZ, monozygotic identical twins who look totally similar, like these two over here, and dizygotic twins who are just like brothers and sisters, uh, regular brothers and sisters in their genetic similarity. For genes that vary between people, their so-called polymorphic genes, <coughs> they have 50% of those typically in common on average. And so what you ask in a twin study is really whether the monozygotic twins are just more similar to each other uh, than the dizygotic twins or fraternal twins. And when it comes to looking at dyslexia, there have been studies conducted over many years, most of which do say, yes, you find greater similarity between monozygotic twins. So if one is dyslexic, the other has a high probability of also being dyslexic, whereas that's less the case for dizygotic twins. Um, the data vary depending on where the twins are recruited from and exactly how you define dyslexia. But it, there have been a number of studies now in different countries that support that. When people think about genes, they often, if you say a condition has a genetic basis, their idea is that there is a gene that actually gives you the condition, and this is, joke is really cap capturing that idea, and furthermore, that there's, there's not much you can do about it. 
Um, in fact, the way many conditions work um, is very different from this. And not just dyslexia, but many medical conditions like asthma, diabetes, have a genetic basis, but it's not that there is one bad gene that gives you that condition. It's rather that there are many different uh, genetic variants, so genes that take different forms, um, where there's one form that's associated with slightly more risk than the others. And it might, in the case of dyslexia, be something that's associated with a slightly lower score on a reading test. But it doesn't make you dyslexic. It's rather that if you have enough of these risk factors, these genes that put you at risk, uh, they, in combination perhaps with an environment that may not be ideal either, all these things add together to really push your reading ability down. And so the total genetic influence really reflects the combined action of many genes, which may interact also with environmental factors. So it's much, far more complicated than the sort of genetics that we might learn at school, where you might have learned about Mendel and his peas, where you really did, do have one gene that just makes your pea wrinkled or smooth, for example. Whereas in terms of dyslexia, it's um, really more complicated. So if we say genes are involved, well, how can you go from a gene to the brain? How might it affect brain development? And we know a lot more about this now than we used to, uh, and it's a very live area of research. This is showing you a, a little slide that I found on this very nice website that uh, is created by some people in um, Belgium who work on mouse models of, of brain development. And what this, this shows you is that um, here we have different stages of embryonic development. And E12.5, for example, means 12 days of life, the 12th day of embryonic life. So the embryo is formed, and then it starts developing. And brain cells start to develop. And what's the interesting thing about brain cells is that they don't just develop and stay put, they move. There is a process known as neuronal migration. And they move quite large distances from where they start at life. They um, go up these fibers, which are known as glial fibers in the brain, and move to a final position. So these green cells shown here have moved from down here, migrated up here through this layer, and then they settle down in a nice orderly layer. So your cortex, your brain, is being built up in layers. And this is the, a day later, you've got a whole load more who've migrated even further out. So the brain is building up in these layers, and different types of cells are in different layers. Now, what you can show is that you can have um, a kind of mouse that has a genetic defect where this process goes wrong. And this is known, this poor old mouse is called the Rela mouse because it has a lot of motor problems. It, it's very poor at um, controlling its movements and has tremor and so on. And the interesting thing about the Rela mouse is that it has a perfectly normal number of brain cells. And it starts just the same as a regular mouse down here. But it, um, embryonic day 14, instead of forming a nice orderly set of uh, green cells here, they migrate, but they don't get far enough, and they are not positioned in a nice orderly fashion. And then the next lot that come, instead of going up here, they stay put. So you basically end up with neuronal cells not well organized and in the wrong place. And this affects their ability to form connections with one another. So you can have a brain that is really just not properly wired up in the first place, right from embryonic life. Why is this relevant for dyslexia? Well, it has been argued that what you see in dyslexia, or in some dyslexic brains, are problems that are like a much milder form of what you see in the real mouse. And this idea was first uh, put forward by Galaberda and Kemper way back in 1979. They were actually studying post-mortem brains um, from the Orton Brain Bank. And this was a brain bank which people with dyslexia signed up to that should they die, their brain would be made available for science. And obviously, these brains are very rare. You don't get many coming through. But Galaberta, a neurologist working together uh, with a neuropathologist, was able to um, look at the first case, this 1979 case, and was quite astounded by what he found. Because what he um, identified was uh, two types of developmental abnormality that seemed to date back uh, 
a very, very long time. So they suggested that the brain's development had been abnormal from the outset. What you see over here is the left and right side of the brain. And the little black dots that are here and here are what he called ectopias. And they are just these little areas of neurons that seem to be in the wrong place. So you've got the wrong sort of neuron in the wrong area. Uh, here he also found something known as a polymicrogyrus, which is uh, a funny area where you, instead of having the normal uh, little gyral configuration of the brain, you have a sort of cluster of small gyri that again are known to arise if you have disruption of very early neurodevelopment. So he got very excited at the possibility that dyslexia may be a disorder arising when you had atypical neural, neuronal migration. But there was a problem, which is that the patient that he was looking at, what was known of the history, suggested there was far more wrong than just dyslexia. This was a, a man who also had a history of language delay, and uh, he developed epilepsy in the teenage years. And in fact, these types of ectopias are very common in people who have epilepsy. So a number of people thought, well, maybe he's really not describing anything relevant for dyslexia, but rather some correlate of this man's epilepsy. But he then found some further cases, again, all post-mortem cases recruited from this brain bank. And they all were not exactly the same. They didn't have the, exactly the same pattern or location of these ectopias, but they did have evidence of ectopias, um, and particularly on the left side of the brain, which was interesting because we know the left side of the brain is particularly important for language functions. But again, the cases, some of them were not well described, and the ones that were described were, um, again, suggesting that they had perhaps more wrong with them than just dyslexia. So one had quite substantial problems with oral language, and another one was late to talk. So it's been suggested that, again, this may not be true of all cases of, of dyslexia. These may be particularly severe p cases of poor reading associated with other things. But this started this idea that maybe um, neuronal migration abnormalities may be involved. And what's nice about it is that it makes sense you can start linking it into the genetic uh, features that are associated with dyslexia. So my colleague in Oxford, Sylvia Parachini, in 2006, looked at a particular gene with a not very memorable name, KIAA0319. But this is a gene that previously had been shown to be more common in a particular risk ver version of the gene. Uh, in people with dyslexia than in non-dyslexics. Um, and in fact, that's been now shown in more than one study, and it seems to be a reliable finding. And so what Sylvia was interested in doing was looking at what the gene did. And she was able to look at gene expression in fetal brain, both in rat and human fetal brain, and found that this is a gene that is expressed in, in fetal brain. Uh, but the risk version of the gene, the one that's associated with dyslexia, had lower expression. What was even more interesting was she was able to do a very clever experiment where you interfere with the gene, uh, and so this is in the rat, um, and was able to show that then you got less neuronal migration. And that's what this graph over here is showing you. Uh, this is the distance that neurons migrate. Um, and you can see this blue bar is much lower than all these other bars. And what the blue bar is, is uh, the rat where this KIA gene has been interfered with so it doesn't function properly. These are a couple of control conditions where you do other manipulations, and these are a couple of other genes that are interfered with which didn't have the same effect. So the argument is that this gene, this is evidence that this gene is involved in neuronal migration. Subsequently, Galaberda, who was the original person describing these ectopias, has been doing further research again with rodents um, really looking at Im the impact of some of the other genes that have been uh, associated with dyslexia and found that they all seem to be involved at some stage in this neuronal migration process and that if you interfere with them, you get these kinds of anomalies. So this looks like a very exciting line of work that might make some sense and allow us to go all the way from genes to uh, the development of the brain to try and explain dyslexia. But I would say we still have to be very cautious. This is all very early days. And we have to be cautious for several reasons. And the first point that I must stress very carefully is that 
these dyslexia risk genes are not mutations. That is, they are not rare cases where a normal gene has suddenly got changed in the course of transmission. They are um, risk um, variants of normal genes that are really quite common in the general population. And it follows then that they're not going to have massive effects and cause major malformations in the brain. If they did, we'd have a high percentage of the population with such malformations. So they must be having quite subtle effects. Also, the association that they have with dyslexia, as I mentioned before, the effects are really quite mild of any of these risk genes. If you look at the mean um, reading score of somebody with the risk version, it's just a few points lower on a reading test than somebody who's got the non-risk version. Um, and the frequency of the, of the risk version is not the if you've got dyslexia, you've got it, and if you haven't, you haven't. On the contrary, so there's a version of this gene that you see in 39% of normal readers, but only 25% of dyslexics, and there's another version that goes the other way around, 30% of normal readers, 35% dyslexics. But as you can see, there's plenty of people with this risk version who are normal readers, and there's plenty of dyslexics who don't have the risk version. So these associations are quite slight, and you have to be very careful at realizing that when people start trying to sort of talk about genes for dyslexia. We haven't got genes that give you dyslexia. We have things that slightly increase your probability. The other point to bear in mind about this uh, whole field of research is that the original Gallo-Burda reports of these ectopias was based on originally just four cases, a few more were added, but the studies were not terribly well controlled in that um, the brains, they got a brain from the brain bank and of course they knew that it was a dyslexic brain when they analyzed it. Ideally what you'd want is a study where you would be comparing a dyslexic brain with a control brain without knowing which was which because you do certainly occasionally see ectopias in brains of people who have no problems at all. Um, the argument is you typically don't see them to such an extent but these are all things that ideally should be analyzed uh, as, as blind as possible. Um, the other thing that's slightly interesting is that now we have MRI scans, we can actually look at the brain without having to wait until post-mortem. So we can look at the living brain um, with brain imaging. And a number of studies that I'll come on to have done this, but they in general haven't reported uh, that there's particularly high levels of these ectopias. Uh, although you should be able to see ectopias on an MRI scan. Now, it's uncertain whether people haven't reported them because they've been looking at other things or whether they really don't exist in very high numbers. And we need, clearly, more research along these lines. But it's quite striking that people in studying brains with MRI scans have looked at all sorts of things and, and commented on many things that they think characterize dyslexia, but not uh, on evident ectopias. So it may be that if they occur, they are, there are perhaps just much milder impact on, on um, neuronal migration that doesn't show up on scans. But certainly the kinds of things that Galliburda initially talked about don't seem to be terribly common as far as we can tell. So a need for caution, but a very interesting line of research that uh, manages to link the genetics with, with the neurology. But what brain regions otherwise have people looked at using brain scanning? And I realize that many of people in the audience are not particularly expert in this area, and you may be coming to this webinar precisely to learn more about it. But I'd be curious to know whether what people's intuitions might be as to which brain regions you might expect to see impaired in dyslexia when I tell you there's this frontal part of the brain which we know is involved in speech production in that we know that if it's damaged in adulthood, your speech production is, is impaired. There's another gyrus here that uh, is involved in motor control, things like moving your fingers. There's this bit of the brain here that's important for hearing. And the cerebellum, which is important for really uh, learning a new skill and automatizing it. So I'll hand back to Dominic um, for another set of uh, questions for you just to see what your instincts are about this. Which of these do you think you might find uh, impaired or different in somebody with dyslexia? The auditory cortex, the cerebellum, this precentral motor area, this frontal sort of speech production, expressive language area, or all of them? 
Okay, so I have started the poll and uh, I'm seeing the responses coming in, so let me just summarize them again. It's the auditory cortex A, B, cerebellum, C, precentral gyrus, uh, D, inferior frontal gyrus, and E, all of uh, the above. So the responses are coming in, so let me just uh, give you a few more moments to make a choice which one you think. There is a c clear f uh, front runner here, so I think I will just, uh, even though if you, had, if you have not made your choice, it doesn't matter, this is just to give us a sense of where people are, so I sh will share the results. The results are A, the auditory cortex has 11%, cerebellum 16%, precentral gyrus only 2%, in field of frontal gyrus, only 7%, and all of the above, a clear winner with 63%. <laughs> uh. uh, this is a very intelligent audience because <laughs> it is indeed all of the above and more. So I realized that this would be a very bo boring talk if I just took you on a tour of the brain and said there's this bit and that bit and they're all associated, but I thought it wanted to give you the flavor of what people have looked at and what they've found. And I just went to a recent um, edition of the Web of Science, which is a, a place where you can look up papers by topic, recently published papers, and went through the first few I could find that looked at MRI scans to look at structural um, differences between dyslexic and regular brains. And these are all the different things that really were coming up just with the first few papers I looked at. So people have looked at the corpus callosum, that's the fiber tract that links the two sides of the brain. The depth of the gyri in the white matter, so how deep these um, uh, gyruses are these these lumps and bumps on the brain. The right cerebellum has cropped up. The amount of grey matter is thought to be reduced in dyslexia in some studies. This auditory cortex is thought to have a different size or shape in some studies. This precentral gyrus, uh, indeed, and the grey matter there, it's been argued, is increased in some studies of dyslexia. And then here it gets really interesting because all the early studies found that they thought the asymmetry of a region of the brain that's buried in here in this temporal lobe um, is usually bigger on the left than on the right, and it had been argued by Galliburda and others that it was more symmetrical if you had dyslexia. Well, a more recent study by Christiana Leonard and her colleagues says, no, it's just the opposite. They find an increased asymmetry, so it's bigger on the left, even bigger in people with dyslexia. They argued, in fact, that this, make, this, this depends on how you define your condition and that this more symmetrical pattern is what you see if somebody's got broader problems involving oral language, whereas the more specific problems with reading, you see this opposite pattern. Um, this frontal region here, the, the lobe um, there, the si its size and shape is thought to differ in dyslexia. This is the sylvian fissure, its position and its termination are thought to differ um, in dyslexia. And then people have talked about this region here in this microstructure of the white matter. And then things just like the relative proportions of the front and the posterior parts of the brain. So you can see that it's really a huge range of, there's almost no part of the brain that hasn't at some point been mooted as the seat of dyslexia or, or the basis of dyslexia. And this is terribly confusing um, when you would want to try and make generalizations. And I think as the field moves forward, we find some things start to um, become more uh, acceptable and replicated across studies, but it's still a terrific confusion at the moment, I think. Um, and the reason why, I think, is partly that the brain is such a big and complicated organ that if you start comparing two groups, you will always find some differences just by chance. And so it is really important that people do try and replicate findings from one study to another. But also the, there is this, always this big problem of how do you define dyslexia. Um, the studies have varied depending on whether people are looking at adults or whether they're looking at children. And this is often also uh, related to how severe the dyslexia is. So a lot of studies are done on adults whose problems are largely resolved, and they're often university students who can read, but perhaps not as fluently as, as their other uh, peer group. Uh, whereas studies with children may be looking at children with much more severe problems. Then some studies exclude those people who've got additional problems with oral language comprehension or with ADHD or with motor skill, other studies include them and that might make a difference. There's also the impact of intervention, which is something I'll come on to. Um, that can actually affect what you see on a brain scan. Um, 
And then on top of all that, there's issues about what methods people use to study the brain. Um, Eckert and colleagues uh, did a very nice analysis of the same brains, depending on whether they analyze them by having somebody patiently looking at the picture of the brain and then tracing around the outline of a particular region and measuring its size and so on, um, versus doing an automated analysis where you just put it in the computer and try and count the amount of cells with gray matter in and so on. And you don't necessarily get the same result because these methods make different assumptions. The automated methods try and fit all brains to a standard size template, for example, and that will affect what you get. And then people vary in the regions that they decide to investigate. So there's a lot of reason why you might get these very mixed results, but there's also, I think, great variation from case to case. So um, it's one of the things that I think surprised people that they expected you would find a sort of classic dyslexic brain when we started doing these studies, but actually you can have two people with dyslexia with very, very different types of, of brain um, pattern. Will we find anything clearer if we move on to look at functional brain imaging? Um, functional brain imaging is like structural brain imaging in many ways. You put your per person into a brain scanner, only this time instead of um, just getting a picture of what the brain structure is like, you are getting them to perform different tasks and using measures that get at the metabolism of the brain and the activity of the brain. And what you're typically doing is subtracting um, the brain's activity when doing some sort of baseline task or control task with what you see in terms of what happens in the brain when they're doing a, another task, such as reading words. And that, that way you can see which bits of the brain are specifically associated with uh, reading or related tasks. Um, there's a lot of work being done using this sort of technique, uh, and Sally Shaywitz is well known for having done studies in this area, and there is more consistency um, than there is, I think, with the structural studies in terms of the regions that are thought to, if you like, light up or show activation during reading tasks. And these three regions that she has noted here, and this is taken from um, a picture from her book, um, are often shown to be active when somebody is reading. This is known as the word form area right at the back of the head, uh, and it's typically activated when somebody does see a word as opposed to just some sort of checkerboard pattern or some other visual pattern that doesn't mean anything. Um, and then there's this area here which has already been known for many years to be important for reading um, because if it's damaged, uh, you often get uh, acquired dyslexia in somebody with brain damage. And then this frontal region, which is known again to be uh, involved in speech production. Uh, and the argument is that you need this entire network to be working properly in order to be able to read, and that you do see reduced activation uh, in people with dyslexia, uh, particularly children with dyslexia, in these regions. There is, however, um, a bit of a problem because you could argue that if these, these are regions that are normally active when uh, somebody who can read well is reading, um, and you find that in somebody with dyslexia they're not looking as well activated, you're not really sure whether you're picking up a cause of reading problems or just the consequence of the reading problems. And I think this was thrown into um, highlight really nicely by this study by uh, Stanislas de Haan that was published last year who really demonstrated how experience can affect the brain. And it's a very nice piece of work, and I'm going to just cover a bit of it because it's also a very complicated study. But they had the bright idea that um, if you want to see how reading, what impact of, there is of reading on the brain, the group you need to look at are people who've never learned to read. So these are not dyslexics, they're people who are illiterate because they've grown up in a situation where they haven't been schooled. And they've recruited people from both Brazil and Portugal, from small rural communities, for example, where it's characteristic for, or it has been in the past characteristic to have uh, some members of the family who don't go to school and are going to work on the farm or whatever. So they were able to compare people who were otherwise rather similar in terms of their background, but some of them were schooled and literate. Uh, then they had quite a few who hadn't gone to, ever to school as children, but did learn to read in adulthood, because in these cultures, obviously, there are attempts made uh, to sort of catch up for those who did miss out on the chance of learning to read. 
And then they had just 10 who had never been to school and were still illiterate. And by comparing these three groups, they could get a sense of how learning to read had affected the brain. Now, what they found, many, many things, this is just a small part of it, but one of the areas they looked at was this so-called visual word form area that you saw um, in an earlier slide, and it's at the back of the head. Um, and this is a slice through the, the top of the head. Imagine you're looking down on the brain, having sliced off the top of the head. So this is, again, the back uh, of the brain and on the left-hand side. And this is showing you how this area does get activated when somebody's looking at written words. And they compare the activation for written words with either a checkerboard pattern or with spoken words. And what you can see is that the written words for four of these groups, you get a great burst of activity. But the interesting thing is these are the literate people, either B is for Brazilian and P is for Portuguese, and I can't remember the one and the two, but basically you've got more activity for people who are literate. And the ones who learnt to read in, later in uh, life, in adulthood, uh, one group is up there, but this other one who are not so good at reading they learned that they were not so competent are down here. And the illiterate people who never learned to read are just not responding to words in the same way. Their brain is, is having very little, no more activity than it would to non-words checkerboard pattern. So this is perhaps not surprising because the words obviously have enormously different significance for somebody who can read than for somebody who can't read. Um, but it's a nice demonstration of how we have to be very careful in interpreting what we see in the brain because it um, actually is affected. It's not, your brain doesn't just do reflect how you were born, what's the nature of your brain when you were born, but also what's happened to you since and what experiences you've had. And that's an important message. The interesting thing that was perhaps even more surprising was that learning to read was also shown to affect how the brain responded when you were given spoken stimuli without any written words. This is a, a region of the brain um, the, in this planum temporale, which is a region that is usually bigger on the left side of the brain than on the right, and is known to be responsive to language. And again, they just measured how it behaved when the person was looking at a checkerboard, was listening to spoken commands, or uh, reading written commands. And you see the literate groups, who are these ones here at the top, uh, you get a big response in this region uh, a bigger response than you do in the illiterate or more recently learned to read groups. So how, whether or not you've learned to read actually affects how your brain responds to spoken words. And this again is illustrated over here with a task known as auditory lexical decision. That's just listening to a word and having to decide is it a real word or a made up word. And again, massive differences. So your ability to do this task is affected by having learnt to read, even though no explicit written language is involved. And you get bigger activity in people who have uh, learned to read than you do in people who are illiterate. So this study um, has implications for how we interpret functional imaging studies of dyslexia, because it means that if we find group differences, we do need to consider could they be consequences of poor reading rather than causes. And it can be very hard to demonstrate that you've actually picked up the underlying cause of dyslexia. You might just be looking at the consequence. <clears throat> the last type of study I want to just illustrate, uh, um, just a sample study, because there's several one could have chosen, but this is like, one of the nicer ones, I think, is um, taking this a step further and saying, OK, that was a study that showed how um, learning to read in adulthood could affect how your brain uh, responded to written words. Um, this is a study that actually shows how in somebody with reading difficulties, intervention can actually affect brain structure um, in a very interesting way. Um, so this was a study published a couple of years ago by Keller and Just. Um, and the method that they used is a method that's called diffusion tensor imaging, which is a way of measuring the connectivity between different brain regions. So you get a bigger signal if you've got more connections between two different regions, and also if you've got pathways in the brain that are myelinated, and that means they're covered in a sort of um, white fatty substance that improves the transmission between uh, different regions so that you actually get faster uh, brain responses from one region to the other. Uh, so it's a measure of brain connectivity. 
And what they did was to look at connectivity before and after an intervention for, to try and improve children's reading. And the reason I picked this study rather than some of the others in this area is that this was a really nicely designed study because they had a, a control group who didn't have the intervention, making it possible to be fairly confident that the differences were not just due to the fact that children were growing older and getting more mature as the study progressed. <clears throat> and the, the children were taken from a much larger study that was being done to evaluate reading intervention in Florida by Torgerson and his colleagues, something called the Power for Kids Reading Initiative. And um, it was children were picked who were poor readers. Uh, I would say they probably, many of them would not really be thought to be dyslexic, although it would depend how you define dyslexia. At the bottom of the slide I'm saying, showing you the criteria they had for poor readers. They had to score in the bottom 30% of the population on a test of word reading efficiency, but not have major vocabulary problems. They had to be in the top 95% on um, this Peabody picture vocabulary test. But they would be children who would be sort of slowish readers, but not necessarily having any uh, really striking problem with reading or massive mismatch with uh, other abilities. Um, these poor readers were assigned to either carry on as before with their classroom, regular classroom instruction, that was 12 of them, or to have one of four interventions. And the interventions were really quite different. I was unfamiliar with these before I was preparing these slides, but I went and looked them up and they really not all the same. Some of them um, involve a focus really on training children's phonological skills, whereas others were more focused on learning whole words or understanding what you read and so on. But interestingly, it didn't make a lot of difference for the purposes of this study, and so they tended to treat these all together. But whatever intervention they got, they got very intensively, five days a week, 50 minutes a day for six months, which they worked out was about 100 hours of reading instruction. Uh, they also had a group of good readers who didn't have any intervention but who they wanted to use to look at what was a sort of baseline um, connectivity index. The intervention results were, I have to say, I was rather surprised they were not more impressive given the huge amount of intervention these children had in the very intensive intervention. This is collapsed across all the different types whoops, of instruction um, because it didn't make a huge amount of difference. But the one thing that they improved on was this task called Word Attack, which is a, um, a reading test where you read nonsense words or low frequency words and it's really giving you an index of how well the child can decode uh, speech sounds and uh, letters and uh, into corresponding speech sounds and work, work out the soundings of words. Um, word identification, both groups improved on, so that's reading real words. Um, and passage comprehension, the untreated group actually got a little bit worse, and uh, the intervention group made a very small gain, but that was not quite significant. So this was the main result impact, was that these children got better at this word attack. Uh, but that's a significant difference statistically. Um, now, what, about, what was going on in the brain? Well, the first, this first comparison, which bizarrely is called B, I'm putting B before A because it seems more logical, but this first comparison um, shows you just what children looked like before the intervention, comparing the, all the good readers with all the poor readers. And what they found was that there were these regions where you're really just sort of saying which bits of the brain are actually different for the two groups in terms of connectivity. And these red bits are showing you this is at different slices through the top of the head again, looking down on the brain at different depths. So that's why you've got three of them. You're already slicing further and further down into the brain. But this little region here um, is really just picking up the left frontal lobe and indicating that there's really more connectivity of tissue um, in children who are good readers than poor readers in that left frontal region. Um, but what was interesting was very similar uh, picture was seen when they compared the poor readers who had had intervention, who as we saw before had improved in their word attack skills, versus the poor readers who hadn't had all this extra intervention, um, and you saw changes in exactly the same region. So this was really very 
striking and it does suggest that the intervention was making the brain connectivity more like that of a good reader after the intervention. They did further analyses that suggested it was, there were various reasons why you could see this result, but they argued that the, it looked as if what you were getting was an increase in this myelination, this um, adding the, a sheath to the fibers so that they um, tended to, you'd get faster neural connectivity. So um, it's nice to be able to see that what one's doing if one's working with a child with, with reading problems is, is actually making a difference at the level of the brain, although there's a sense in which we, we get very excited by this, but you could argue, well, of course the brain has to change because you can't, the brain does do everything that you do, and so it's bound to make a change, but this allows you to see where it is. So I want to just close by considering the implications of, of these, this sort of line of work um, and returning to the, the question really that we started with, can studying the brain help us understand dyslexia? I would say the answer to that question is resounding yes, um, because we've learned a lot through the neuroscientific approach. I think one of the things that we can say is that poor reading isn't just down to bad teaching. I mean, obviously, some children who are bad at reading haven't been well taught, and, and one wouldn't want to say that that's never the case. But there's a tendency sometimes to just blame teachers for everything if children are not doing well. And the evidence from genetics and from things like the studies of neuronal migration really do give credence to the idea that some children are just unfortunate in, in having their brains uh, wired up in a way that may not be as easy for them to read as other children, just as my brain is not very well wired up, obviously, for doing three-dimensional imagery. But the other thing that the um, studies really emphasize is the individual differences between children. Um, dyslexia isn't caused by a single gene mutation. There's not a gene for dyslexia. We don't see a regular pattern of brain lesions, malformations. And the differences we do see are pretty subtle. Like they're hard to uncover, uh, even with the most modern methods. And I suspect we'll find that they do differ from child to child to an extent that makes it hard to generalize. I've emphasized quite a lot about the work on neuronal migration abnormalities, which is a current area of great interest and very exciting, and it would affect brain microstructure and I think may limit one's ability to form connections between brain areas that are important for reading. But I would stress that you need to be cautious and not assume that this is the whole explanation. And my guess is that we'll find that this is more the case for those children who have severe intractable problems or for those who have associated problems affecting oral language or motor systems and it may not turn out to be a factor for children who have more isolated problems with reading or problems that do respond to remediation reasonably well. But I think one of the things that one feels reading these accounts of, of brain and dys, in dyslexia is that there are real differences between children in, in their potential. This is a quote attributed to Albert Einstein, but I don't know whether he really said this, but it, it is quite a nice quote that everyone's a genius. If you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And of course, it's really getting at the idea that what we need to do with children who have these problems is to identify what they can do and, and train them to do that well, rather than uh, necessarily trying to or teach them by the same method to learn to read. Uh, I'm sure that's something that all the teachers who are listening in will already think they know perfectly well. It's a general truth. Um, but I feel that sometimes, um, having argued that these studies of the brain are very useful in understanding dyslexia, um, that sometimes people sort of assume it can do everything. And I'd be interested in the views of the audience, really, in terms of what they think about the implications of this research. Uh, in terms of what it might help with. And so we've got another little poll coming up, which is to say, do you think this uh, type of research is useful for screening for dyslexia or diagnosis, for deciding how you teach or what to teach, for perhaps deciding who merits extra time in exams, or none of them, those are things, or all of those things? Okay, so I have put up the poll and we're getting responses in, again with a clear front runner. <laughs> uh, and uh, so again, let me just run through the options again while people are voting. Uh, it's the the studying of the brain can help us um, in the following areas: screening, diagnosis, deciding what to teach, deciding who merits extra time in exams, 
none of the above or all of the above. So that's A, B, C, D, and E. And most people have uh, made their choice. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, just close the poll for now. So uh, thank you very much. These are the results. 28% uh, people of the people chose screening diagnosis. 8% of the people chose deciding what to teach. Nobody chose deciding who merits extra time in exams. 13% uh, uh, of the people chose none of the above, and 51% uh, all of the above. Oh, right. Well, that's really interesting because I'm much more pessimistic than the audience in that case because um, my answer, I think, would probably be none of the above. Um, or possibly, you know, help with is, is perhaps a, a reasonable word to use for some of these things. But um, I feel it's often overhyped. And um, I'm rather more sympathetic to this comment by um, Hirsch, Pasek and Brewer, who talked about something called the brain education barrier. They went to a conference in Chile on early education and human brain development and said, on day one, it became clear that myths about brain-based pedagogy dominated participants thinking. The Chilean educators were looking to brain science for insights about which type of preschool would be most effective, whether children are safe in childcare, how best to teach reading, and the brain research presented at the conference was mute on these issues. Um, my own view is that if, you know, we, we're all very keen at looking for a brain biomarker, but in terms of diagnosis, we really are a long way from being able to look at a child's brain and say, oh, they're dyslexic, which would be having a biomarker. And what I'm struck by is the huge differences from one child to the next. So I'm not confident that we'll ever get to that point. On screening, people often say, well, if we had a good brain imaging study that would allow us to pick out the children who might become dyslexia, we could use it to screen. But that's really not very realistic, because are we really going to put lots of children into a brain scanner, which is a massively uh, complicated and expensive procedure, when I think we actually, if we want to predict who's going to have reading problems, we can do that pretty well from behavioral measures. Things like whether children actually know the names of letters are already uh, very good at predicting which children um, at the age of four might go on to have reading problems. Um, and again, I think it's just the level of accuracy is not good enough with our brain measures. Can neuroscience inform teaching? I would say not really. It can show that learning to read changes the brain, it can confirm that reading involves a complicated brain network, different parts of the network are problematic for different children, but I still think we shouldn't be overwhelmed by these wonderful pictures of brains with bits lighting up, because at the end of the day, the cognitive analysis, the analysis of the reading process, I think will be the best guide for diagnosing what a child needs. I think we should have neuroscientists and educators talking together because the neuroscientists do get ideas about how the brain circuits involved for reading operate and how different types of skill are integrated in the reading process. And there's plenty of scope for talking creatively with educators and trying to sort of get new ideas about approaches. But I would, I, my concluding comment would be that really the careful analysis of children's reading behavior and underlying skills should be what guides intervention not neurological tests, and that we shouldn't get too carried away by the pretty pictures of brains. So I love the brain research. I think it's fascinating and interesting and tells us a lot. But I think we shouldn't be so overwhelmed by it as to think it's superior to the sorts of behavioral studies that we often want, need to do. And that's the end, all I have to say. I'm sorry I've gone a little over time, um, but I'd be happy to take a few questions. I wanted to follow with a picture of the public library in Seven Kings where I grew up, which, without which I think I wouldn't be nearly such a good reader and not be where I am today. And I've also put up a couple of um, reference slots there. Um, there's a list of references for the talk here and the blog um, that I mentioned at the outset uh, has a number of pieces in it that might be of interest. But thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this was this was a, a wonderful lecture. I can personally recommend the blog. I, I read it regularly, so I definitely <laughs> definitely recommend it for uh, for great insights in, in in many areas of research in in this area. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to remind people. We already have a few questions in, but I wanted to remind people that if they want to ask a question, uh, you can do it via the control panel and expand. If you have collapsed it by the orange button with the white arrow, you can you need to expand it again clicking on the orange button and uh, uh, and then you type your question in right above the send button and uh, and that will uh, and uh, that will send the question into us perhaps if I could be allowed the first question uh, regarding your last slide uh, there mm -hmm. was a uh, there was a recent report by the uh, by the Royal Society uh, 
uh, on neuroscience and the second mm. part of the report was nurse implications for education and lifelong learning and I read the yes. report and and I have also talked to a number of people including some uh, leading policymakers in this area, and it seems to me it can, that report can be read in two ways. One, a very optimistic way, which I think many policy makers are taking it, uh, which is that actually neuroscience can do all of the above on, on your question there, there, as opposed to as opposed to the sort of more sober reading, which is what you're offering, uh, which is that that actually we need to be quite cautious about uh, expecting neuro, neuroscience to do too much. Uh, so it's for the frontline uh, workers in 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 teaching and interven in literacy interventions. So do do you have a, a comment on how we can sort of reconcile these different readings? Yes, I mean I, I think perhaps one of the things I should emphasise is I'm I'm cautious about everything. I think I'm probably unduly cautious and pessimistic, and it's it's part of the the way I operate. Um, but. I, I think uh, what that Royal Society report, which I, I, I was involved in, and I, I, I was almost the sort of Cassandra on the panel who was was continually sort of saying no, no. Um, but but there were people there who were much more upbeat about the prospects, and I think a lot will depend on on how the field develops in in, in future years. Um, but I think what we did all agree on was that there should be more communication. Uh, between neuroscientists and, and people in education, uh, because the, the point I would emphasize from the end is is that the um, neuroscience can I think give you these insights into processes involved in reading because it might make you just think differently about things I mean that model of Sh that Shaywitz put up of these different brain regions talking to each other has already suggested that there are there is perhaps a need to not just think narrowly about um, training phonological skills, important though that is, uh, but that that needs to that those abilities need to be tied in um, to get the person able to or the child able to rapidly uh, and automatically recognize whole words and at least feed off on one another. It's not a case of either phonics or whole word reading. So I think you can get insights. Um, from the brain models, but that also, I think what I dislike is the idea that somehow people treat it as a sort of, uh, you know, the neuroscientists being able to pass down their valuable knowledge to the teachers who don't know anything, whereas on the contrary, I think the field would benefit if there was more two-way interaction. Um, that what is very disturbing, and another point that came out of that report, is the extent to which what one would say is not very good neuroscience or sort of rather flaky neuroscience ideas get bolted on to not very good interventions uh, and somehow they're given credibility because they sound as if they're doing something fancy in the brain and again if there was more interaction I think between neuroscientists and uh, educators um, it would mean that people would be more discriminating in how they evaluated those. Okay, well, well th uh, thank you very much. I uh, will uh, now get to the, where questions are coming in hard and fast. So I apologize if we do not get uh, to all of them, but one that has come in from several people is asking your opinion on, on the magnocellular theory. Yes. Um, well, I think the magnocellular theory of, well, those who don't, are not aware of it, that there's the idea that there is a particular class of cells in the brain, magnocells, um, which are important for, that they're well known in the visual system and they're widely accepted as uh, being in the visual system and affecting ability, uh, that there are sort of sl slow and fast pathways in the visual system. And it's thought that uh, the magna cells are uh, specifically affected in dyslexia. Initially this was thought to be uh, a visual problem that was much talked about. Subsequently, um, John Stein and his colleagues and other people in the States have argued that there's a sort of auditory equivalent of magna cells, which also are impaired in the auditory system. I think, that, again, it's, it's like so many of the things that I've reviewed here. There are one or two studies that seem to offer some evidence for uh, deficiencies in magna cells. Most auditory scientists uh, don't necessarily accept that there is a auditory magnocellular system, so that's a, that's a much more speculative idea. But um, I suppose I'm just cautious. I feel at the moment the evidence is not strong enough for me to feel I could support it, but I wouldn't rule it out. So I'm sorry, I sit a little bit on the fence on that one. But it's just one of the many theories that's out there um, that has a few bits of evidence. One of the difficulties in this field is that each person has their own theory and tries to gather evidence for it, but there's very little work where people actually contrast different theories and see whether they really um, stand up against each other, and we need more work that's a bit more integrative, I think. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there are some, there are a number of uh, questions uh, regarding sort of specific specifics, uh, but one that has come that it's probably gets very often asked uh, who by Nim is asking, do you agree with the perception that dyslexics are right-brained? Uh, uh, no, I don't think there's much evidence for that. Um, I think there's, insofar as there's evidence of anything very much, it may be that language is less lateralized, although even there, as I was saying, in terms of the, the structural data, that's a bone of contention with some people saying they're more lateralized than some less. We did one study of language functioning uh, using a, yet another method where we, we found some evidence of, of a re reduction in lateralization, but it wasn't that it, uh, they were using the right hemisphere, it was just that they seemed to have a rather less efficient left hemisphere. But it, it also will depend on which function you're measuring. It's possible, but it's very speculative that the difficulty may arise because maybe two functions that might normally be mediated by different hemispheres are both being done, if you like, in the same hemisphere. That's a theory we're, or a hypothesis that we're, we're quite interested in. But I don't think there's good evidence that they are specifically right brain, no. All right, thank you very much. Uh, here's a specific question about neural, neuronal migration uh, from Liz, who is asking, does it continue after birth? If so, for how long? And can gene expression affecting it be altered by environmental factors? Oh, that's a very good question, but I'm not a sufficient expert to really know. My impression is, and I, I would need to check this, um, that the neuronal migration it doesn't continue after birth. I think it's, it, you've got your neurons in the right place by the time you're born. Uh, but it would certainly prenatally, there's good evidence that it can be affected by environmental factors, and a lot of the experimental work on animals is showing that uh, you can, uh, it, it might be affected uh, by uh, either physical damage or to, to the brain. And I, I would imagine there would be other toxins that could affect it. So um, I don't think it continues after birth, but then there are other aspects of neural development that do continue after birth that certainly can be influenced by neuro, ne um, environmental factors. So one has to think, I think, beyond just neuronal migration. But I don't think it continues after birth, but I am not sufficient of an expert on it to be 100% certain. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question from Alpa. Uh, who's asking, who's relating sort of how, well, how can we use the results of neuro research uh, for determining interventions. She's asking, how, can we decide based on this research what kind of intervention the child would benefit from? Is it, the, for instance, the difference between the whole word approach or the phonological approach? Well, I, th I think that's the sort of question that those people doing this research would love to be able to say yes to in the sense that, you know, we would all think it would be ideal if you could put a child in a brain scanner and show, oh yes, you know, this child has a well-developed some, something or other area and, and that, that's compatible with this kind of, kind of intervention and vice versa. And you occasionally get neuroscientists who, who try and argue along those lines, but my, I, I'm very, very skeptical. I think that, as I said at the end, it, you're more likely to be able to um, identify most appropriate interventions by uh, doing the sort of assess, say, a dynamic assessment, try, try and teach them by different methods and see which one they respond to best and so on. So it's really coming back to the point I made at the end that I'm perhaps rather skeptical that you know, the, the neuronal data are going to be superior to essentially good old-fashioned behavioral data for answering those sorts of questions. Okay, thank you very much. And here we are kind of a related, again, so relating question related question that kind of pushes the, the boundaries of what the research can, uh, can uh, show as from Helen who's asking, do you think that dietary deficiencies might be involved in inhibiting brain development and that, and that is needed for liter literacy skills? I think that that can happen. Um, I mean, we know that children who suffer from malnutrition um, or who have major problems with metabolizing fatty acids and so on, that you can have effects on the developing brain. But in general, that does not seem to be um, a factor in dyslexia where these genetic factors do seem to be much stronger. And there's really, um, I don't think any not any evidence I've ever come across that shows that the maternal diet during pregnancy is, is a major risk factor for having dyslexia. So in extreme cases, you, you can see children who have really fairly substantial problems with the diet where uh, I think you would typically though then get 
not just dyslexia. I think you'd get more widespread uh, effect on intellectual development and motor development and all sorts of things. So the, the, the striking thing about dyslexia in its purest form is, is just ha you know, that you have the child who isn't intellectually retarded and doesn't have major delays in other aspects of development has just this one problem. And there's not much evidence that I'm aware of that this would be um, influenced by any sort of dietary deficiency that would be that selective. I have never found good evidence for that. Thank you very much. And uh, Jared, Jared is asking on the difference between si in, in sizes between lobes and connectivity between lobes, which is supposed to be important. Uh, could you comment on that? Sorry, I missed the first bit of the question. Basically, the question is, diff can you comment on the differences in size between lobes and the connectivity oh, yes. between lobes? Um, well, brain size will just largely reflect the, the number of neurons that you've got. Uh, and connectivity uh, is what people are getting really, really interested in because they're finding that you may have two children who both have what looks like the same size brain and, and you wouldn't really pick up any differences on measures of size. But these, this method that I mentioned towards the end of DTI, this um, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, picks up the connectivity and shows that that may be, I think people are getting very excited that that's probably the more important thing and that does continue to develop throughout childhood uh, and it's so the, the general view is that that may very well be a more sensitive measure of development uh, than simply how big or the relative size of, of different bits of brain. Okay, uh, we're running over time quite a bit, but uh, yeah. if we could just have uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, okay. from the, I was just select from the many that, are, that have come in. Uh, uh, and perhaps, again, following on your, on your, on your last uh, comments, is Lynn is asking uh, if there should be more communication between researchers and practitioners. Could you predict some of the areas of discussion that there should be? Um. Well, I think the, the, what would be nice would be for the researchers to perhaps hear more about uh, the individual children and you, that, you, that the practitioners see and the ones who, who are really difficult to teach and the sorts of things that practitioners try and that they may find perhaps unusually does work or doesn't work. But I think there's a tendency amongst researchers, and I count myself in amongst them, that if you get too far away from the phenomenon you're studying and you just sort of get a child in and put them in the brain scanner and take them out again, you, I think you really do need to get a feel for uh, the extent of the difficulties, uh, the variation from child to child, which I think might make us you know, perhaps less willing to try and come up with these global theories. Uh, but I, I think it's, it is very, very useful to also have practitioners. I found that, I mean, most of my work is not on dyslexia, it's on language impairments. And I just found right from the earliest days it was very useful talking to teachers in some of the schools I worked in about the sorts of things that they were trying to do with children and the methods that they were adopting, which sometimes in, involved being quite creative and thinking outside the box and doing something very, very different from what was normally done in, say, trying to teach a child new vocabulary or learning to read and so on. Um, so I, th I think it would be very useful for researchers to be exposed to that sort of input. Okay, and uh, finally a question from uh, Alpa who's asking uh, on occupational therapy and could this smoothen the neural pathways and enhance reading in dyslexics? I, my, my guess is, again, I've already explained what a, a negative person I am, but my guess is no, um, on the grounds that all the work that's been done on, on training and, and effects on the brain on training show that you can, tra you can have big effects on the brain from training skills, but you don't tend to get transfer from one skill to another. So you can, even within a domain, so you, you can, for example, train somebody to juggle and you can show that this actually alters how their brain is working but only when they're juggling um, and you are unlikely to then find that you get transfer to other skills. And so I know there are some remediation methods that sort of argue that by motor training you might you know, enhance the brain in general ways and improve reading. But the, the neurophysiology that we know about so far doesn't support, doesn't really give that, that much hope or much confidence that that's really going to uh, be effective in terms of producing some general change in the brain. It, it tends to be very specific to the skill you're training. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think this, we'll take this as the last question. Okay. My apologies to uh, the many people who, whose questions we did not get to, uh, but um, we have also, several people have asked about the PowerPoint 
and we will make that available later and also we'll make the available the recording of today's webinar so we, you should receive an email hopefully at some point next week when this is all available uh, for you so uh, let me thank you again uh, and uh, uh, for taking the time to be with us thank you again to everybody attending for taking the time to uh, to come to one of our uh, public lectures and uh, have a great rest of the evening and uh, a great summer thank you so thank very you. much thank you